So right before we went live, Blessing read a tweet that uh, broke all of us that I feel like we need to share with the world right now. She right. banged you on Mike Azui till I nut and bolt. The Arch. words. Shout out to Michael Heim. Michael Heim. That's, that's Heim. Michael Heim right there. A poet. <laughs> A real poet. <laughs> a is. real poet. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Kind of Funny Games cast. Of course, I am Tim Geddes. I'm joined by the new face of video games, Blessing at AOEA Jr. Drop him. Give me 50, Tim. <laughs> it's just going to continue, isn't Drop it? Him, give me 50. I love it. And the Nitro Rifle, Andy Cortez. Hello, gamers. Hello to you as well. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing great, man. Yeah? I'm doing great. I, I've realized that... Uh, you know, the game plan has slowed down a bit ever since we started doing this Pokemon mod thing. And mm -hmm. I've just gotten really invested in editing Modern. parts of it and just having a lot of fun with it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because uh, for people that don't know, Nick has been playing Pokemon Fire Red for the very first time uh, over on the streams. Uh, they've done uh, three days now, one long one, uh, two other days. And by the time you listen to this, there's probably another one on the way. It's uh, a Nick lock. It's not a Nuzlocke. Exactly. Mm. Well, it's Nick playing Fire Red for the first time. Right. Nick playing Pokemon for the first time. Exactly. Uh, but we decided to, to adapt the Nuzlocke rules, which if you don't know what those are, it's just essentially a challenge mode to make Pokemon more interesting for the 10,000 time you're playing through it but for nick it being his first time we wanted to add some fun but not make it too difficult yeah so. the real nuzlocke rules are like you can only catch the first pokemon you encounter in a region or in a little zone in any route. A little map, yeah in a little route and if you don't catch them then you can't catch that pokemon ever again and like all that stuff was like a little too strict we realized and we also with the you know a lot of the people in the audience who were donating and, and gifting subscriptions they wanted to be able to name the pokemon too so we wanted to have as many names as possible so we wanted to make it a bit easier, and basically we're, we're keeping the permadeath mode in there. But if you have a Pokemon, that Pokemon like faints. faints, it's going in one of the boxes, and it's never going to see the light of day again. We have a little in-memoriam segment for it. Uh, we talk to its loved ones, and we let them, you know, they set up a GoFundMe, and we kind of like help them out with any of the funeral, funeral expenses and everything. Um, but it's been a freaking blast. And uh, as we are getting closer and closer, I was like, let me, I just Googled like Sprite replacement. So I think it'd be really cool if I could see like Nick walking around in the world. And then I found an awesome program named Hex Maniac. Uh, Hex Maniac Advance. So it's like essentially a Pokemon editor for Game Boy Advance games. And uh, really just kind of fell into a rabbit hole and just lost myself to it. And been having a lot of fun replacing the Nick sprites, replacing uh, most of what I could do in game because the game still has... A lot of limitations that suck. Like, I wanted all of us in the game. I wanted friends of Kind of Funny. And, like, the game just doesn't really allow a whole lot of that, unfortunately. How come? Like, what, what are the limitations that you're bumping up against? Um, sprite uh, and, well, palette limitations, for sure. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a way to, like, get around the coding there. But um, I'm able to edit some of the sprites that are only for... Um, emeralds, because it's also it's a Fire Red and Emerald mod, mm -hmm. and so I can edit some of the Emerald sprites because those aren't in Fire Red, and I can put them into Fire Red. But there's like some of the little the Overworld ones were the ones I really wanted to edit. Yeah, I wanted Nick to be walking around and be like, "Who the fuck's this redhead guy with the bushy hair? That's goddamn Snowbike Mike. He's in the he's out here like roaming around." Unfortunately, I can't do that, so I'm just having to like edit the sprites as you get into battle and you see that little sprite come across. When it, and it that part does stink because I, I wanted all of us to be there and unfortunately I just can't find a way around that but it's been so much do, fun. Do you think that there is a world where you eventually are able to just make your dream Pokemon game? I I I think so. I mean that could be done here. Like you can edit all the maps. You can put the NPC place wherever the fuck you want. You could put uh, items here. You can make that trainer walk this way. You can make this trainer just kind of like walk up and down. Like there's a lot of custom. This is like basically you can customize everything you want. Um, but um, I'm hoping for the development to continue on this. They haven't updated it since like December of last year, which okay. is kind of a bummer. Uh, but the Discord does seem like pretty you know active, so I'm hoping that they're continuing work on it. Um, because I want to I want to get all of us in the game. I want to see all of us in there at random moments, kind of pop yeah. up. Uh, the storyline with Mike is that um, anytime you run into Mike, he, he's undergoing a new fad, a new change in his life, or he's like, I'm really into bug catching now, and he's bug catcher Mike. Uh, and in the cave, he's like, I got into really, I got into hiking. I bought some hiking boots for $400. And so hopefully, I want to see that storyline through and have it. him pop up at random moments. Um, 
Here's it's, your storyline where you're wearing really short shorts. Yeah, I, <laughs> with Brock I, I, as your my job was like daddy. basically before every, um, before every gym leader, you would see me pop up, and I'd mm. be one of the people in there. Unfortunately, I had broken the encounter where you're before you fight Misty. There's a dude in the water. Mm. I can't swim, so you're supposed to walk up to my spot, and my spot goes like time mm -hmm. to battle, and he's like. Please help me, dude. Like, I'm fucking <laughs> I'm so scared. I don't know why I signed up for this, why I applied for this job. And unfortunately, that I found out why that encounter broke and stuff. But it's just, it's been a lot of fun and like getting back into like that game dev mode of all of the trial and error and creating so many duplicate files to like, well, this one, I'm, I only want to edit this to see if it breaks yeah. this or whatever. It's been a lot of fun. So dude. damn cool. Blessing. Yeah. Are you, have you ever been more impressed with any human being besides Andy Cortez? No, I love seeing the footage. It's like, insane. just the fact that when you're able, like you're, you have the artistic skill to actually put those sprite arts together and then also like be able to implement them in game and have that, all that shit work. Like when you first called me over to your desk, what a week or two ago and showed me like, I think it was Kevin uh, at the beginning of the game. Yeah. I was like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> it's so it's so funny to b just kind of go in there. You know, we've had we've encountered a lot of deaths uh, mm -hmm. in this game so far. A lot of like permanent deaths where some Pokemon have have bit the dust and yeah. they're now six feet under. And now tonight I can go back into the game. And the next time he talks to Greg, who was the rival, Greg, I'm going to edit the text to be like, Damn, you lost this Pokemon and oh, this Pokemon, damn, like, dude. I don't, you're not fit to really own Pokemon. And a, bu a bunch of random. There's a lot of like random little like bits of humor that I'm kind of dropping in there. Uh, there's a guy coming up pretty soon who uh, looks like an old man, but he's like, I'm actually, I'm not actually an old man. I'm in, I'm wearing a disguise. My name is Ethan Hunt, and I've been disavowed. <laughs> <laughs> I've been disavowed by my government. I love it. So dude. There's a lot of like cool stuff I'm kind of like uh, putting in there, but a lot of it is like very kind of funny centric humor. At one point. The NPC that I had made for uh, for Bless just started off with, um, hey, man. <laughs> and, that's like, and that was the way that he approached you for battle. So I really want to try to get that in for the future. Uh, I love really it, hoping man. to do that. And on top of like all the stuff you're doing being really cool, I just feel like it's such great content. Like This is one of the those kind of funny streams that I feel like is going to go down in history. Like It reminds me of the Metal Gear stream. reminds yeah. me of the Mario World stuff we did. Like This one's just hitting different. And so thank you, everybody, for showing up. But it also reminds me of one of my favorite video game entertainment moments of my life, which was Twitch plays Pokemon. Oh, yeah. oh, right. Where I was glued to that, watching the updates and like getting so attached to the lore of these Pokemon. And I feel like you guys are doing a great job where I'm watching and like, there's some that like faint and I'm like, no. And like, you get weirdly invested in like Nick's Pokemon, man. It's like a very cool thing. So thank you guys for, for doing such great work, but also thank you all for, for watching and, and hanging out and they're going to continue. So Please uh, keep keep supporting. <laughs> We're 18 hours in and we haven't hit the SSN. Two we badges, two badges. You got two Christ. badges, baby. <laughs> that, I was telling Nick this. And by the way, Nick is in, which oh, like, yeah. makes me so excited that like Nick is actually having a great time. I was telling Nick, I was like, hey, there's a million Pokemon games, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how this it's goes. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but anyway, this is the Kind of Funny Games cast. Each and every week we get together to talk about video games and all the things that we love about them. You can support it with the Kind of Funny membership. It gets you the show ad-free. You can watch live as we record it, and you get a daily exclusive show from Greg Miller. Um, of course, if you don't have a buck to toss our way, that's totally cool. You can watch on YouTube or listen on podcast services around the globe. Uh, but if you really wanted to go above and beyond, you can become a Patreon producer like Carl Jacobs, Kieran Hovisapien, and Delaney Twining have done. We appreciate all of you so very, very much. For this episode of Gamescast, we've been doing a lot of reviews. We've been doing a lot of uh, uh, of look back episodes and all that. I want to do a, a general discussion topic. One of my favorite things to do here on Gamescast. We don't get to do it enough. Hades 2. The Rogue Prince of Persia. Hellskate. Hyper Light Breaker. No Rest for the Wicked. What do all of these games have in common? Seem really good. They, they all, all seem, seem really like good, good games I want to play. Yeah. yeah. How do you want to play them, though? When they're done, they're 100% released and out to yeah, the public. Yeah, but what could I interest you in playing the games and giving you access early? <laughs> I mean, is it like, so I'm playing these games early, but mm -hmm. I still have access to them? Mm-hmm. Does it sound real? I don't believe yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't but believe what that. If I told you that this is the <laughs> world that we're weird concept. We're That's talking weird about concept. early access games, everybody. Uh, Andy, you brought this topic up uh, in, our, in our meeting. You were just like, we should talk about this. There's a lot coming out. Um, I just recently did a, a preview for Rogue Prince of Persia. I got to play 
about 30 minutes of it. Um, that's coming to early access uh, in, in just about a month. Um, you got to play Hyperlight Breaker during uh, GDC. Um, that we don't have an actual date on, but it, it will be coming to early access. And then today, as of recording, Hades 2 was just announced to um, be coming to early access with uh, whatever the hell they're calling I think it's it. a technical test. A technical yeah. test um, coming. That's the test before the early access even begins. So I think that's actually a great place to start. Then. Oh, and also we are on the, I want to say, eve of No Rest for the Wicked uh, coming to early yeah. access as well. Um, so, Andy, let's start here. What is early access? Early access is a way for developers to get their game out there to not only get funds into the studio because you're you're paying for this early access unless it's a free to play game and meant to always be a free to play game but it's a way to get funds into the studio to kind of continue development while also getting really key feedback and I had only really heard of this I think through Hades 1 I think that was the first time that I heard of what early access was and I had early access and I remember it was the year that you dropped water on my laptop, mm -hmm. and then Razer sent me a new laptop, a laptop to replace it. And I was back home in the RGV, and I had Hades One on my Razer laptop, and I kind of hopped in for a bit. I was like, "Okay, this is cool," and kind of forgot about it. And, and if I remember Hades correctly, actually, ended up coming out and becoming one of the goats. That was uh, Game Awards where that happened, where yeah. I spilled the water. And that, if I remember correctly, it was during that Game Awards that they actually announced. And I, I'm pretty sure it was during the pre-show of the Game Awards they announced Hades. Early access, you can get it. Mm. I might be wrong about that, but I, I, I think that that adds up. So, so yeah, so did you end up playing it then? I all? played a little bit of Hades during that early access period, and I wasn't... I knew that, like, I'm probably not the target for this. I think uh, the early access... Unless you just get really into a game, right? Like, I've gotten super into a lot of these survival games during early access, and then I fall off, mainly because I want... I, I want to kind of discipline myself to... Let me step back a bit, and I'll. There's other stuff I need to play now. I'll get back to this when, in a couple of months, whenever there's a a large milestone release. A lot of these early access games will kind of have smaller intermittent releases where, hey, we we made I don't know fucking crafting faster. We made you pick carrots out of the ground a little bit quicker, and then they'll have here's a big milestone release where there's a new dungeon and there's a new boss. Go try out this boss now, and. A lot of it, you know, on the negative side of things, you could look at it as like, oh, you're paying to test out the game. And on the positive side, it's like, well, a lot of these games have been made way better because of immediate fan feedback. And we saw that with Hades, and we saw that with Baldur's Gate 3. Dead when, Cells? Uh, De well, Dead Cells was an early access? I believe it was, yeah. Oh, shit, I don't remember that. Um, yeah, Baldur's Gate 3, I think, is like one of the best examples of a lot of people playing it early on. And maybe not fully thinking this is going to be one of the best games all time, but being into it and enough of the hardcore fans are there to provide feedback and to say, this should be better. Let's get on that discord to tell the devs this. Let's get on the subreddit to let them know this feedback. And through er the early access period, the 1.0 release happens. And that's the game. That's the day that, Hey, the game's out now. The game's gone gold. The game's ready for people who don't, want to just necessarily beta test a game uh it's out now 1.0 is out go go after it um we got super into a multiplayer game called um oh gosh it's a it, it was a four-player dungeon crawler that we minecraft all, dungeons it was very it's a first person game i'm blanking on it hopefully is Chad it the can, one where kevin kept fucking up yeah the kevin kept lighting himself on fire um, regular minecraft <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> um, but that was an early access game, and that hit 1.0 last year. And there's, I think, a bit of excitement about that whenever you play an early access game that you're into and you feel like, I've kind of hit the limit, I've hit the wall. Oh, shit, 1.0 is out now. It's a year and a half later, two years later. Let's hop in. Let's hop back into that game we enjoyed. Let's see what has actually changed here. Um, so I'm, I love early access, and I also know that if there's a game that I want to wait for i might just wait for the one the big 1.0 release you know plus what's myth your myth force myth force thank oh, you Madonna. okay the the more the cartoony one right yeah, yeah it looks like more cartoon. Cartoon. Yeah, yeah yeah plus what's your top level take like what's your opinion personally on early access games oh, i think it's great i i think it's the it's a proof is in the pudding situation where so many of the biggest indie releases especially are like you know non-triple-a releases we've gotten in the last 
however many years have come out as early access, right? And like we go through the list of games, talk about Hades, we talk about Baldur's Gate 3, you talk about Dead Cells. I think Minecraft might have been early access at first, right? Like I, oh, yeah, I believe definitely. was Fortnite, Fortnite also. Yeah, like I, I think the a lot of battle royale. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of these games, a lot of the biggest and best games that we've had in the last, I would say, decade have started off in early access. And like me personally, I I don't know if I've ever gotten in on the early access. Right, like I'm somebody who prefers to wait until like a full release unless it's something that is a i guess a Fortnite situation or a multiverse situation my mistake i think Fortnite was in beta for like eight oh, was three it beta? years it was called beta for like way too long yeah one of those but it never it was like not a final release which i always thought was was interesting until they finally did it and it's like all right cool i guess it's yeah final now but <laughs> go play the game it. you've been playing yeah. yeah um but you know i think a method of putting out a game so you can get that technical feedback from maybe millions of players or like let's say a million players right like that is a luxury that you don't have when you're creating this game in a bubble and it is your team of developers and your QA and whoever you have, you're not able to test games out to to the same degree. And so I think that's why we get something like Hades where we get that final version and it is, oh man, this feels tweaked to perfection. This feels like they've taken so many things to account. It's not buggy. Like this game just works and it comes out and it feels perfect. I'll say the same thing with Dead Cells where I'd be so curious to, to play that first version, that first early access version of Dead Cells versus the final release version of Dead Cells and see what the difference is. Because I imagine it's probably a big, um, like, oh man, this feels great. Like the numbers feel right. Like the upgrades feel right. I think it's fascinating that a lot of, I feel like a lot of the early access stuff tends to fall into certain genres. Like I think it's a lot of survival, but then also a lot of like roguelites. And I think a lot of that comes down to, hey, these are games that really depend on how the players are playing them, right? Like these are the evolution of like, I guess the gameplay loop or the game, the gameplay progression is so hinged on how people are interacting with the thing that even as a developer, it's like, okay, well, there's only so much I can do with my own information or with like our information as a team. We need hundreds of thousands of people to be playing this thing so we can really understand how to make it great. Um, but yeah, like me personally, I've, I've, I've so rarely jumped into an early access thing. I'm even looking down the barrel of this year where we talk about Hades 2 or No Rest for the Wicked or Hyper Light Breaker. And I'm ex I'm super excited for all three of those games. I feel like there's a fourth one I might be missing. Uh, oh, yeah, the Prince of Persia. I'm excited for all four of these games. All four of these games are exactly my type of thing. I don't really... I, I don't have interest as much in the early access. I think with something like Hyper Light Breaker that I'm so curious about that I want to jump into it. But Hades 2, I'm like, I can wait for Hades 2. I can, I'll play maybe maybe a one or two sessions of No Rest for the Wicked and then put it down, right? But like, I want to play the final versions of these games. But if this is what they de need to do to make these games incredible, then go for it. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I think I'm with you too. It's just, I, I can't lie that I have like a mental block up with it where I just, I feel a lot less compelled to play the games when it's early access and when it's promoted this way. And it just, it kind of feels like I'm like, I don't want to do the work of like testing the thing. I want it to be, be done. And it's like, all right, cool. Then just wait till it's, it's all out. But there is a lot of cases where these things are, are free, but then there are cases where you need to, to pay for it. And there's something about that, that I just don't love the concept of. Um, but I also understand that like for a lot of these games, they are from smaller teams. Um, and even from bigger teams, it's like the money has to come from somewhere. Like you need, there has to be the business to be able to back up the, the creativity. Um, I, I think a lot of it does come from the super fans of the project. Yeah. And somebody who me as a massive hyper light drifter fan and always wanted, what would this world look like in 3d? And then now to have hyper light breaker. And even if I had not played it and I was not in media, I'd be like, yes, I'm going to throw down money because I want to help out this developer because I want them to make the this cool thing that they're working on. And you don't got to leave feedback. Steam does have a, a mm -hmm. refund policy. You know, you can't get your shit refunded. Uh, but I think what we're seeing with a lot of these early access stuff, like you're rarely going to get the fringe fan in. A lot of it is the person that knows this game is coming out, is excited for this game, wants to get in and see how it looks right now. A lot of it is also to kind of see the promise of it. Like mm -hmm. what... You know, when I was offered that opportunity to play No Rest for the Wicked last month and was able to hop in and be like, holy shit, this is... I knew this game was going to be good. I didn't know it was going to be this. And now, like, my excitement's just shot through the through the roof on that. And now I want in again. And what have they done since the last thing I played? Mm -hmm. And what sort of things were maybe held back from that version that I can now kind of get a glimpse of? Um, I think I just, like, because... 
I know the way I like games to feel. I'm super down to leave feedback on things like this and be like, hey, the lock on feels kind of weird in this moment. Um, maybe level progression doesn't feel fast enough or maybe it's a little too, uh, in this survival game, maybe it's like too extreme on you. Um, I, I am the type of person who loves providing that. But for someone like you who's like, I don't want to do the work. Like, I think the best part of it is like the people doing the work are going to be the hardcores that have been invested in this project before they totally. can even invest their money. You know? Yeah. And it is funny. Cause like something like Hellskate, which is very much a Tim thing where I'm like, I know how that's supposed to feel. And I'm so impressed with the game because it is so close to feeling exactly the way that it should. And it's like, I'm not tempted to like give that feedback though. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I know we talk on shows and stuff, but like, it is there's just like barriers to it where it's funny like with something like hellscape like i am so excited for that game and i have a playable version right now and i just don't feel compelled to pick it up and play it on my steam deck just because i'm like i don't want to even taint my experience with this i just want to wait for it to to be be finished and like that i i know that that's a me problem because it's like there's no, i don't need to play it then i don't need like everything's totally fine it's out now like i can just play this and it's great so far but there's just something about it being incomplete where i'm like I don't want this weird experience with it. I think that's also the way you play games and the way I think the way we all play games where there's somebody in chat who Madognik 96 is well bless try 2KX or fuck 2XKO I hate this name for this game so much. Yeah, well bless too. try 2XKO there is an early access or beta this year. And like I mean we talked about like you know beta versus early access for whatever reason right I, pl I played plenty of betas. I played the Overwatch beta uh like what when it came out a few weeks before Overwatch actually came out. Right? But that was like a oh this is up for a week and it's your chance to test out or not even test out try out the game for yourself right like i i see there being a difference between early access as a way for devs to get that feedback versus mm -hmm. hey this is a way for you to see if you're gonna like this game yeah that said like i don't know if i expect to xko to come out in early access but if it does i think i'll jump into it and i think the main reason and the main difference between 2xko versus something like hades 2 or something like no rest for the wicked and these other games that are coming out is that 2xko is way more of a competitive thing that I see myself playing for a longer period of time, right? Like I want to get on the ground floor because I want to be good <laughs> with like the people yeah. that are playing. And I want to, I want this, I think for me, I look at this game as something I'm going to return to in time and time and time again anyway. And so I'm going to play it in that fashion for Hades 2 or for no rest for the wicked. Or if you name any single player game that I'm playing uh, this year or that I've picked up recently, it is all right. We get the review code or I buy the game and I am playing it for a week to two weeks and then I finish it and I put it down and it's done forever, right? Like I am not coming back to, uh, I guess right now is where we're talking because I am coming back to Hades, right? But that's mainly because I didn't beat it. If I had beaten Hades years and years, uh, back in 2020, it's not like I'm coming back to Hades every two months to play more. I might come back to it a few years later, yep. right? Or I might play it maybe twice a year or if I'm somebody who's a big fan, you know, I'll come back to it time, like a few, a few times here and there. But it's not that consistent thing of, yeah, I want to like, have my moment with this game right now and then put it down for eight months and then come back around and have my moment with the game again. I feel like for early access, it is, well, if I'm going to invest myself into this game and play it for the 10 to 15 hours or 30 hours I expected to play it for, I just want to play it when it comes out in that case. I don't want to, like, I guess bust my load early. <laughs> yeah. No, dude. Yeah, that's me with that, like, when I was playing in Shrouded early in the year. Like, I, I fucking blew my load too early on that game where, yeah. like, I was in there for so long. And again, a lot of that comes down to the ADHD hyperfixation shit where I'm just like, this is all I care about right now. And that's all I cared about for like at least six or seven days straight. And then I was like, you got to stop because this game's going to eventually come out, you know, and check back in a year from now to see where it's at. Like, don't, you know, don't burn yourself out too early on it. Um, and with, with YouTube saying, like, you don't feel compelled to leave feedback, like, that's not a you problem at all. That's just, like, that's just human nature. Like, we we get 15,000 views on these videos, and, you know, 200 people will click the like button. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And it's, like, one of those things, it's, like, it's such an easy thing to do, but sometimes people just don't feel like doing it, and that's totally fine. And, like, I think, again, I think a, a lot of this comes down to supporting the project that you, you want to believe in this project, you want to support it. And um, the idea for me is, like, but there's so many games out there. there there's so much um, saturation in the market right now. There's so many big games coming out all the time. It's really hard to keep people's attentions in one way or another. And if I want a certain project to succeed, like I'll back it in hopes that 
the people working there don't get <laughs> laid off anytime soon. Totally. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's an, that other aspect to it where this creator, I want to see them create things for the foreseeable future. Let me throw a couple bones at it, and you know, hopefully that'll extend the life the lifespan of the studio. So taking this in a bit different of a direction of looking at some of the games we're talking about, like clearly there's been major success stories when it comes to this early access stuff and then ton of failure stories, but we don't talk about those as much because they end up not really becoming the big things yeah. we're talking about. Do you think that with something, does it read weird to you guys that with something like Hades, that Hades 2 is also going to be in early access? Like that with something like Dead Cells, that Rogue Prince of Persia is also going to be early access? It's like, wouldn't they have gotten what they needed to learn about those type of things from the first game to apply? Like, I know there's going to be new weapons and new features and new things, but like, there's something about that that I find I, I'm curious with. Like, like what, why? And it's like, well, you found success before, so do it again. But like, do you get what I'm saying here? I do. I, I think a lot of it comes down to the studio just wanting to get money in early. Um, and you could look at that as a good or a bad thing, depending on the size of the studio and depending how maybe scummy the higher ups are. Uh, where, you know, when we hear about Robert Kirkman from Invincible wanting to crowdfund a game, it's like, motherfucker, pay, <laughs> get funding. Out your, what do you mean? Do yeah. You want, you know, like you, you shouldn't need funding for a video game. And I think a lot of it comes down to um, the same reason why we've seen large companies do Kickstarters every once in a while. Like, who would say no to extra money up front for a product that may not be fully done for a while? Where... If we wait to put this game, if we wait to put out this Prince of Persia game in a year and a half, who knows if it even sees the light of day in a year and a half. If we ask for early access funding right now, and we, we believe in this product, if shit pops off, those sales will get rolling in immediately. That's immediate income into the studio. Like, that's kind of the way that mm -hmm. I look at it. I think, for me, it's more of a question of why not. Um, like, I think if you have the ability to put something out there and get the feedback before you really put it out there, and now it is go time, it is reviews, it is all these things, then I think you're running lower risk, right? Like, I think you, you have that period where you can go, all right, how do, like, how do we make sure, I, I think if you ask the question, how do we make sure that our audience is going to love the thing? You put in front of the audience and go, hey, do you love the thing? And then based on the things they don't love, you fix those things, right? And that is, I, it almost becomes a question of why doesn't every developer uh, release a game in early access? And to that, I'd be curious on, like, what those conversations are internally in studios. I think a lot of the time we get early access from games because it is, like, smaller studios or indie teams or maybe Kickstarter. And it's a Kickstarter uh, goal type thing to get the audience in front of it so that they can have that feedback because they're there to fund it. Um, I think you have plenty of those reasons. But I think when you... For a, for a Hades 2 and it working so well with a Hades 1, I think it is a, well, we know how to make a Hades, but, you know, like, we still, we're putting in these new powers, these new abilities, these new features, let's make sure that this sits right with our audience, and so when we do put it out, it's a 10 out of 10. It almost feels like cheating, but, like, it's like, well, that's the game, why right? Is it? Like, yeah, exactly. I think, I think you maybe also run the risk of not having that first, like, that punch when you do put out the game fully, right? I think some games are able to do it. Baldur's Gate 3 had it where you had early access and you had the punch. Hades had early access and they had the punch. But I don't know if that's going to work for every game. Like if Nintendo put out a Mario, if Nintendo put out Mario Odyssey in early access, for example, would that launch day feel the same? I don't know. Like this comes back to an argument I have with um, a conversation I had with Roger all the time. Uh, back, like I think last year when we did the Blessing Show where me and him went back and forth because I'm like, you know, I, when it comes to the Blessing Show, I'm like, yo, I don't know if I, if I want to put out like, the headline of the episode i'd rather just premiere the episode and like as it's premiering the people learn what it's about right but roger likes the idea of hey if we do the youtube premiere the weekend earlier right like get pe be able to advertise what the blessing show is about maybe that brings people in and it is you kind of have to weigh it as totally. a developer yeah um i it, it's interesting because i the way i look at it is uh like i i see cameron kennedy uh in the chat right now comment that I usually don't end up going back to games for New Game Plus, so like most games won't get a second life for me, even if I like them. And for me, uh, the way I look at it is like I am not beating this game in early access. Like in no way will I play this enough to have hit credits or anything like that. I I know that that's something that I will wait for like 1.0 release or whatever. Um, and as far as like sort of spoiling the reveal, the debut of it. I, it kind of reminds me of like 
games always kind of have a second life whenever they come to PC from PlayStation, right? That's always like a year and a half later. It's like a brand new debut. Let's talk about all the numbers and everybody gets the social media splash from it. I think because of how sensational a lot of like media can be now, if the game isn't great in early access, like that, it, that does not spell great for you True. because, yeah. because a lot of, I think Hades and Baldur's Gate 3 being in early access and being more under the radar as they were when they were in early access and then them coming out and being this massive success, I think that has likely hurt a lot of other small developers trying to do the same thing. And I'm not like trying to cast blame on those two yeah. awesome studios for doing that, but um, it makes it tougher because smaller studios then trying to do that and people go oh it's out in early access oof game's not good and maybe them maybe not necessarily knowing that yeah of course it's early access like Hades wasn't this good at launch Baldur's Gate wasn't mm. this good at launch yeah. and we have to wait for the 1.0 release in order to truly judge it um, but I think in some cases the early access may be looked at as damn this is what you all came out with like yeah. oof not looking great for y'all and see, that's, that's really interesting, and I want to talk about why after a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Factor. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. A ton of us here at Kind of Funny have been so thankful for Factor since we've been in the new studio, and you can too. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. Also, discover more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. What are you waiting for? Get started today and fuel up your springtime goals. Get chef-prepared meals on the table in two minutes with Factor's ready-to-eat meals so you can get back to doing what you love this spring. Head to factormeals.com slash kindoffunny50 and use code kindoffunny50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code kindoffunny50 at factormeals.com slash kindoffunny50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. So you guys, you guys talking about this, like uh, everything you just said, blessed everything you're just saying, Andy, Hades to Hades too. I feel like that's uh, what's a interesting part of this is like, it's a known quantity already, right? So yeah. it's like those expectations. So it coming out in early access, I feel there's going to be a lot more. I, I guarantee there's going to be a lot more people playing Hades two in early access oh, than yeah. there oh, were yeah. to yeah, play yeah. Hades one. It, it shifted the eco, the landscape. Yeah, yeah, Hades and it's, so it's like, is everything. that good? I, I don't, e I don't even know. Like, I feel like, like going back to it, like there's something. It's great for I, Super Giant I, 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 <laughs> potentially. I yeah. mean, well, if the game's amazing, which we kind of expect that yeah. it's going to be, but it's just, it's weird to me where I understand. Oh, this game's in, there's a beta, there's early access for a multiplayer shooter game or for a super in depth. I mean, a lot of it comes down to multiplayer stuff of like getting the balance right of things. There's something I always thought was weird. I remember first seeing Hades being like, why is this game in early access? Like it's it's a single player just game. Like what are you doing here? But clearly it worked for them. So them doing it again, I get it. But do you have concern, bless, about Hades two being early access compared to Hades one? I think the my biggest concern comes back to what I was talking about with Punch, right? Where when Hades say Hades two comes out in early access this year, and then Hades two comes out full release fall twenty twenty five. When we get to the full release of Hades two. Do you still have that punch, right? Like, are you holding things back from early access that now that you've dropped the full thing, it feels like this big, like, oh shit, all right, we're here. Like, Hades 2 is happening and everybody's showing up to it like it's a full game. You imagine through early access, the full thing isn't available, right? Like, I would only, I didn't play the Hades 1 early access, but imagine it'll only be like maybe one or two of the areas. Maybe over time they add in a couple more areas to see what people think. But like, I, I would, it would have to, I think you would have to have that balance, you hit that balance right of, hey, we're holding so much back in the Hades 2 <laughs> early access build just to make sure that we're getting the data we need from people. And then during that full release is when it is, all right, throw everything at them, right? Like give, give them the full thing. If you can have that punch, then I th I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, I'm of the mind that I think even more games should have early access, right? Like No, Man, uh, no Man's Sky back in the day, I think if that launched the early access, that would have been so much better for that game. Uh, G like GTA 6 is coming up, right? I think if... For GTA 6, we've seen the online launches and how those how, how those look for AAA games in general, let alone what GTA 5 was from GTA 5 to GTA Online. If they can put out a GTA 6 and then they go, hey, we're putting up 
online, let's say a week or two later, but it's early access online. And then maybe a month or two down the road, they do the full release of online to get through those kinks, get through those weird bugs and shit. I might think that that's a better way to do it. As it's so to interesting. It, it's supposed to what they do with GTA literally 5. just putting words on a thing just to be like, hey, yeah. and they finish. But I do think, I, I think words can make a big difference, yeah, right? Yeah, they can totally sway the perception of it. And like, you get people defending, like you get people on your side of like, hey, we're, they're working through it. Like, and hey, let's give the feedback and get it there. And I, you, I think you can turn the conversation to be more positive as opposed to fuck this, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. as opposed to... Oh, uh, you got to wait for like the two or three week patch to come to fix those issues. Like if you're if you're playing a Hades type game and there's a an enemy that's just ridiculously powerful, and then that's something that maybe they would fix later on. Why not just have them fix it during the early access period and you chop it up to hey, we were just waiting for feedback. You know, yeah. you get lost in the game development, sort of like haze. You don't really know what's good or bad anymore. Um, that's where all of those moments can really be beneficial for the game and for the studio. Uh, and not only for like, more for like the press side of things, right? Like getting that, that positive marketing out there, you know? Do you, do you think Anthem would still be around if they had launched an early access Holy and called that first year? This first year is just early access year. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because like the core of the game felt so fun anyway. Like mm -hmm. just the core flying around and shooting was, I think strong enough to carry the weight of that pro th that project and from then on any issues that people had would have been well a lot of them were technical issues just things not working random enemies spawning here and there but a lot of the issues that people had were um uh, the gear and the loot and the leveling up and like the enemies not feeling set like all of that stuff is like hey bioware is working on a destiny like sort of game right mm -hmm. it's a shared world shooter whatever the hell you want to call it um, we have up to the first big boss that you play. Try it out. See what you think. Let us know about progression. It's about six hours of progression. How do you feel leveling up? I think I think this system could be beneficial for anybody going forward, except for maybe like I'm only thinking of like maybe super story driven campaign type games. I don't yeah, really like know I don't how the Last of Us needs <laughs> an yeah. early access type thing. I mean. You can always use, I mean, a lot of that is also just QA, giving feedback of like, hey, this feels yeah. weird, or other people in, in the studio letting uh, the developers know what doesn't feel right and what could use improvement. But I just really think about like, I don't know what genres don't work for this, and I really do think it'd likely be a sort of story-based yeah. game that you don't want spoilers for or whatever, you know? I think especially for the multiplayer stuff. Like, I go through the Rolodex of the failed uh ones that have come through right like the anthem or fall fall 76 i would count is like didn't have a good launch it still is the place where i like go back to it and i'm like Ooh. but if that came out in early access i think people would at least give it a bit more mercy right like i think people still might not be happy with it and like i think the question is do you eventually get there i think the biggest problem with anthem outside of like it not being early access is that they abandoned it pretty quick yeah if they had like launched it in early access and didn't abandon abandon it and continue to like hey, let's make the content, let's give people what they want. That could be a flourishing game. Like I, I think that game had everything going for it, aside from, yeah, you play that version at launch, it's like, ooh, okay, well, this doesn't have enough here. Not enough variety, all that sort Not of stuff. Not enough variety. Yeah. And like I think I think there are so many other examples of like multiplayer things that come out, and it's, uh, and it's like, oh, man, if you had given this some more time and you could have maybe bought more time, I think it comes with a couple, that comes with a couple stipulations. One, obviously the shoot doesn't fit a shit doesn't fit every foot right like <laughs> yeah you have suicide that squad fucking that, that fucking shoe yes suicide squad that came out this year i don't know if early access would have changed the story of suicide squad right like you have plenty of games like that but uh there's that and then also would people have the or would people be willing to pay an ea 60 dollars to play anthem in early access i could see that being a problem i think the benefit for a lot of this early access stuff, uh, like one of the benefits is you usually pay less for it up front. Is that the case though? Yeah. Yeah. Because so, like, like I'm trying to find info on Rogue Prince of Persia of how much it's going to cost. Because I was just under the assumption it's going to be free. But mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like that's the case. Oh, and you mean access to the early access? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, free isn't ever usually a thing unless it's a free to play game. Like yeah. most early access stuff I've done, it's like, you can pay 20 bucks against the early access, try it out, see what you think, or maybe you just fall in love with it. You pour a lot of hours into it. 
But when it comes out, it'll be more expensive. So mm-hmm. you're you're being benefited by hopping in early. Yeah. And then a lot of that also goes to like when you were talking blessing about like you you have to give these games time to develop that second life and that second debut. And a lot of that doesn't happen without funding. And if yeah, those early access, you know, the, the game has to come out looking super promising in an early access form to where word spreads and people go, oh shit, that game's actually really good. Might as well hop in now and yeah. not have to fully pay the extra $10, $15 whenever it comes out. Um, but that also, again, just really benefits the studio by keeping that studio being able to develop that game for, um, you know, for the next, you know, year, year and a half or whatever. Um, it just provides a lot of stability, I think. Yeah. Uh, like, like Valheim is one that was super beneficial for being in early access. Valheim being, um, an awesome survival game that comes out and is in early access and does really, really well. And words like word spreads like wildfire of like how good this game is already. And then, Eventually, more and more people start paying for it, and they have a shit ton of money to continue to develop the fuck out of it. I did not realize Valheim was still in early access. Yeah, it is like still, it it is still a developing game, and I don't know when they'll ever exit that. It feels like, I mean, it feels like that was the release. I mean, they came out with a, they came out with like a DLC. I've, I thought (laughs) this is so bizarre. I mean, it it has 381,000 reviews. I don't know how many players it has, but obviously, it has millions of players, right? Like, yeah. That's pretty insane. I would have assumed that that was a full release. Is Pal World full release yet? No, Pal World is still, still early access. Well, so, I mean, I yeah, it barely yeah. came out. Like, it came out in like what February or whatever. February, yeah. Well, I, I see Pal World being see, in early I, access for another year or two. And I <laughs> thought that was a full release too. I didn't realize Pal World was also early access. But yeah, like, and what Pal World's thirty bucks. Valheim is twenty bucks. And like, we saw the sales on Pal World, right? Like that had that sold more than many full game yeah. releases. Yeah, and they made that money. And they're going to come out with a full release, but whether or not the full release is even like as successful as early access, Almost does matter. it matter at this yeah. point, right? Like they made the money. So I, I'm looking at uh, the Rogue Prince of Persia's um, Steam page right now, and there's a couple things I want to read. And th- the reason I keep coming back to this game, one, I'm very interested in Prince of Persia, but two, I'm fascinated by the release marketing uh, plan that this game has had. Like this game was did not exist. Yeah. There was a couple rumors and leaks like maybe like two weeks before it was formally announced. But then it was announced where I got to play it, and then they're like, yo, it's coming next month. Like, that's pretty wild, especially how close this is to Prince of Persia Lost Crown, which I, I find baffling that they would want to uh, put these out so close to each other, given how similar the genres are. Um, but seeing this, it's going to be early access, so I, I kind of give them a little wiggle room with that. of just like, hey, the actual game's not going to be coming out for who knows how long. So it won't be like right next to Lost Crown in that way. Um, but, but reading through here, so why early access? We want to work with the player community to create the best version of the game that we can. We believe we've created a great core of a game, and we have our plans to expand it out. But we know the invaluable impact of directly involving the players. Early access will let us arrive at version 1.0 with the best possible game experience. Uh, and then they go on to talk about how working on Dead Cells uh, and updates and DLCs um, has allowed them to see under the hood of one of the best roguelites out there and appreciate how effective early access and the importance of open communication between the dev team and the players can be. We want to do the same thing for Rogue Prince of Persia. So it's cool that they're at least being completely straight up about everything that we've been talking about here. Um, how, approximately how long will this game be in early access? We plan for it to be in early access for about a year, probably a little longer. Of course, we have our plans for extra content, but the whole point of early access is to work with you, the community. So if we need to take a couple of months more to improve the game, uh, cause you're giving us great suggestions, then we're going to do it. Um, What's the current state of the early access version? A challenging but accessible action platform, a roguelite combination of fluid platforming. There are six levels, two bosses, several primary and secondary weapons and upgrades and medallions. And then will the game be priced differently during and after early access? Our current plan is to double the amount of content from early access to 1.0. So we might raise the price price. uh, (laughs) to really reflect the content of the game (laughs) as it develops. Of course, any price increase will be communicated well in advance. So it's just it's interesting where, you know, they're being as transparent as possible. But you can only you can only look at this a little bit kind of weird because it's Ubisoft and it's a big publisher. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's where. 
that's where the lines get blurred. And then at that point, you're like, well, at what point do you stop looking at it weirdly? Because of, you know, Super Giant is a very big studio as well. That's and, the thing. Larian's yeah. Yeah. giant, too. It's like, like I, I, mean, I, Larian, yeah. I, I think it's great for for products and and games and projects to be able to flourish for the longer term. Because I think without early access, a lot of these projects will get killed quick, killed off quicker um, and not really given the the amount of time to fully see like its full life and its full potential um i just checked right now by the way um valheim which has not had a major release at all like <laughs> in a long time uh has twelve thousand concurrence on steam pal world has twenty four thousand on steam only that's not xbox that's just steam only mm -hmm. yeah twenty four thousand concurrent players is still like pretty nuts for these games and uh, again a lot of that isn't really I don't know if that happens without early access. I don't know if that happens without you being able to tell the, the community, hey, the problems that are there, we get it. We're working on it. I think if you advertise yourself as fully out, then it's looked a lot more negatively. We're like, well, then why'd you fuck the, you put it out if you knew the pro there was a lot of pro um, issues there and problems? Yeah. Like, you knew there were problems. Why'd you release it? There's a way different way to look at it. It's like, oh, it's an early access thing, man. I'm just these problems we know that they're there we want you to help us with the feedback i can't help but hate this it's a nice marketing it's nice marketing i don't, marketing. I don't really. have any issue. like i think even on the triple a side even if you're a triple a publisher if you're ubisoft right like i look at something like rainbow six siege and that wasn't early access but that came out and the launch was like kind of like all right that's fine like it, it was it wasn't a big launch but then over time they built that game and that be that game became a sensation What's the difference between that and an early access, right? Like if they were to just put the label of early access and go, hey, this first year, this is a feedback year, right? Like we're taking in what you have to say, like we're making this game better. And then year two is the official launch and you have the same exact result. I think that's the same thing without as much disappointment in that year one, right? Where it is, okay, well, we know what this is. You know what we're talking about. Again, I go back to the GTA Online thing where if, G if Rockstar is like, hey, GTA Online for the first month, it is early access. Or even, even if they say for the first six months to a year, honestly, we talk a lot about how are they going to do it? Are they going to release online and single player separately? That took like two years to get good. Like yeah, right? GTA Online. You know how long it took for GTA Online to kind of to kind of get there, right? <laughs> I think if GTA Six Online, they go, yeah, we're launching online the month after GTA Six, but this first year is early access, so you're not going to get heists, you're not going to get X, Y, and Z thing, but you can run around the world, you can do all these fun things, and we're taking in all your feedback so we can make sure that this game is awesome. Again, GTA 6, one of the, or GTA, one of the highest grossing franchises of all time, I'm fine with it. Like, yeah, do your thing, get your money. I guess technically they're getting, they're getting it to you through GTA 6, but even still, right? Like, if a AAA publisher wanted to charge me, let's say $10 less or $20 less of what that game actually is, go for it. Like, if it makes the game better, I think it's, I, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Tim, mm-hmm. What would make you feel good about it? I don't know. I is, think, it, is it a money thing? Is it I, like, if it were free, fuck it, why not? But no, then you look at it as like, why would they make it free, free if they could charge? For people, right? Like, yeah. I, there, there's something about it that I just, I, I feel like it's a genre thing where it's like for big online stuff, I get it a little bit, like not a little bit, a lot differently. Like mm -hmm. I understand the needs for things, but when it comes to something like, and I, I get the, like the, the, there was something to the balance of roguelikes and like all of that, of like wanting to make everything great. But I mean, it, isn't that what making a game is you know what i mean it's like it's like you want to make a movie and you want to have a great story it's like well the story is the point of that whereas the mechanics of the the, the balance of the weapons and stuff that is what the game is yeah for a 2d dead cells type thing and like i know you can make that argument about anything but like that to me is the thing that i'm just like yeah sure every single game ever could be better if it had a built-in year-long uh get feedback stage and then everyone gets feedback like Tim, yeah any Wouldn't movie be could be though? made better with all the Zack snyder cut uh, b-roll you know what i mean yeah <laughs> like, I mean, yeah I mean, you want to make your movie better but it's, it's going to be two hours longer sort of the yeah, situation yeah <laughs> so I, I don't know i think i think this definitely for me does just come from a privileged consumer perspective of I want make the game good at first. Yeah, yeah. You know well, what I mean, I'm, and I and I understand that like a lot of this comes from the reality of them wanting to just make the best product possible, not caring necessarily about that first impact, but more about the lasting impact. And at the end of the day, that's probably a better call. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, the way I look at it is like I think a lot of that is why QA exists, and a lot of that is why you see 
if a studio says, hey, why do we got to hire QA if we can just fucking put out <laughs> early access and make yeah. money off of that, right? Instead of, and that's what really sucks is like how QA is be, becoming so devalued, even though they are so valuable as a, as a department. And on the other side of things, the, the product will only really exist for the foreseeable future if, uh, it, when you're getting that feedback, you can kind of get into, again, that sort of game dev haze. Or when you're drawing something and you've looked at it for so long, you can only have a certain perspective on it. And then you put it out to the consumers and they go, man, progression is so slow in this. Why am I taking it so long to level up? You're like, fuck, you're right. We, we should have like maybe fixed all of those things. And that's where that immediate feedback helps out. But I don't disagree that you can look at it. I, I totally understand your yeah. viewpoint of like, well, that's what kind of making a game is. It's about figuring out what, you know, what the perfect sort of concoction of, of uh, you know, the progression and items and level ups and all that stuff, like for, especially for a roguelite, which requires a lot of experimentation yeah. with builds and with, well, shit, now this thing is super OP because I got the plus five, you know, you eat an apple and you get massive amounts of health and maybe that wasn't necessarily tested out. Like, there's so many variables in roguelites that I think adds to the difficulties in, in development, but I totally see your point you, of like, well, that's game dev. I think the more gamey something is, the more it becomes a necessity, right? Like, I... Like I think the way I the, I think about it is like Gone Home, for example. Gone Home could never come out in early access, right? You, if you played an early access version of Gone Home, you'd be like, "What the fuck, right?" Like, yeah. so fucking walking I'm picking up notes. Like, are you gonna how are you gonna tweak the notes? How are you gonna balance the fucking <laughs> thing, right? But like, you know, I'm right right now. I'm working with uh, one of my friends. We're trying to make a card game, and we're talking about you know we've done a few play tests, and we're talking about okay, we got to go to either a Pax Unplugged or we got to go to like a Pax West or whatever it is. And get this in the hands of people and like watch them play it and get that feedback. That's the only way that like, and that is a, that's a board game thing, right? Like that is a very accepted and very like, um, uh, like that's the thing everybody does in tabletop games is you get your game in many people's hands and get as much feedback as possible. I think the thing about video games that makes it interesting is that video games is the balance of game design, but then also it's the story and the art and all these things. And I think a lot of the time when you're looking at the art side of it, yeah, it's like, you know, you don't, I wouldn't want to play a early access Death Stranding or an early access Last of Us or an early, and like, yeah. I think you can cross genres in terms of how much you want to, you want to call it art and story versus gameplay or whatever it is, right? But like, there's so many things where I wouldn't want to play the early access version of it in the same way that I wouldn't want to watch an early access version of Oppenheimer, like my favorite movie. Um, but I think when you're talking about, I think multiplayer games like we're talking about, right? Or something that is a roguelite where it is anything all that needs sweets, balance yeah all anything that needs that that intense amount of balance it is more i think it is more healthy for a video game to get that early access stage or get that feedback stage obviously feedback is, has always been a thing it's not like you know you have the qa you get have demos you have all this shit early access i think is just a new way of doing it that it, it's an interesting way to frame it. It's a way to monetize a demo. And it, yeah, it's a way to monetize it. It's a way to like have it out there for longer and get that continuous yeah. feedback. It's well, a way to like see over a long period of time how do people interact with this thing and how's, how how does it grow? I think it's a valuable form of feedback, but it it is to your point like I get the I get the concern, confusion and like trepidation when it comes to oh well, like you're just making a game, like right? Like is, this is this is part of the process like is isn't like the point of it to get into people's hands at the end of the day as opposed to before the day ends yeah yeah and it, it's interesting in the chat uh jesse romero says majority of films do audience testing so it's almost like early access and it's like yeah absolutely the testing and getting in people's hands getting in front of people all that's so important but that's all behind closed doors that's not a public thing that anybody can opt into and that is usually very specific targeted demos that are trying to get specific feedback about and you're not paying certain things either. and you're not paying right yeah. and more often than not you're getting paid yeah <laughs> to uh, yeah. do that stuff or it's you know some type of uh, perk or something so obviously there's differences in movies and tv are not games and games do have a lot of unique things about them that I think make early access make more sense about getting feedback from people that are actually interacting with the thing that is interactive, like just how it feels, the feel of something you don't really need to worry about for movies and things like that. It's a different type of feel, but um, yeah, so I, I, I do totally get it. I, I get it business wise for sure. I just think that it's, it's hard for me to not start with like a, mm, and oftentimes end with the oh man i don't like this 
for things where Rogue Prince of Persia, it's like, all right, cool. In next month, I'm going to get to play some of the game. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You know? But you're essentially having another little demo preview period almost. Yeah. Um, so, and in that case, some people just don't want to, you know, spoil the experience for themselves. And, they'll, and that they'll, to me is kind of the, the biggest thing, too. And again, I know a lot of this is me just personally talking about how I play games, but, but it's also, it, Tim, it's also like not voting. You can't complain about who's uh, in office if you're not voting you know that is you got you got to use your voice you got you got to you, you got to use your voice but also i still complain about who's in office <laughs> <laughs> that's true still, still oh, oh, that's true but like for me like when i'm playing through a game like and some of these things do have like progression into um like the the final versions of the game which is cool i don't know if that's going to be the case for this i don't know if that was the case for hades but um i hope that it was and that to me does make me a little bit more excited of like i think for the most most part or most of the time i don't think it is yeah. Unless maybe multiplayer stuff, but I feel like what Baldur's Gate three, I feel like I remember people being like, "All right, cool, time to start over," <laughs> type stuff. Yeah, which is the reason why I wouldn't jump into it. And that, that to me sucks. Where it's like Hades two, if my progression will carry over, I'm a lot. A lot of my concern goes away. Well, I'm like, all right, cool. Hmm. Hades is a game I want to play. The progression matters to me. Every run, you get something, and it makes the whole thing better. That to me makes a lot more sense than just like, hey, you're just literally like playing parts of this game that are unfinished that we're literally looking for feedback. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. The, ah, I'm, I'm making the same point over and over. But if, like, if Nintendo put out the next 3D Mario early access, you jumping into that shit? I mean, I'm going to jump in, but I'm going to be as upset as like I am, which yeah. is like at the end of the day, not that upset. It's just like, I, I'd probably be upset too. It's, but it's <laughs> be like, one, save this for the for like that magical moment where I get to play the final build. Percent, <laughs> and it's like I, I would that make the Mario game better? Probably, Probably yeah. you know, but like, does it need to be? <laughs> or just can we just get the thing we're going to get and like Give love it or gun, hate it for the know? reasons we do? Give him a gun. Give him a gun. Everybody. You imagine watching Dune 2 in early access? <laughs> for, you know, like, it's just like in theaters for a year, but there are some scenes missing and they have that <laughs> version. They have that yeah. version available. As long I, as I, I had watched the, uh, the scene of the Harkonnen flying up the side of the mountain, that's all uh, I that's so cool. I watched uh, Wolverine Origins in early access. Oh, me Remember too. Yeah, oh, yeah. So did I. <laughs> wow. When the, game, the, the movie leaked before it came out. and it I was thought like you were joking un- about the final movie just feeling like it's unfinished. No, oh, no. <laughs> well, that too. But there was it was all unfinished CG. And God, it's a ride. It was Bless. bad. Yeah. It was like it's a lot of animatics of just like like a fucking <laughs> T-pose Wolverine doing shit. Like, it was really terrible. Um. All right. Well, any final thoughts on early access? I'm uh, stoked for No Rest of the Wicked tomorrow. Hell yeah. Or I Thursday. am too, man. I, I've been a little down on it just because I'm a creature of habit. And I just want more of the things I like. I like sequels. I just I like the thing once. Give me it again. And I love Ori. So I was just like, yeah. I don't know about this. But the more I look at it and the more I hear y'all talk about it, I'm just like, fuck, this is going to be good, isn't Dude, it? Dude, it's special, man. Yeah. it's I'm so no, excited for it. it. Dang it. What what's the deal with it? Because I know we just talked for an hour about early access. But this game's coming out in early access this week. Thursday. 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 Okay. The eighteenth. All right. Is that the? Is that do Thursday? do you know? Yeah. And I'm trying to put you on the spot here. But like, what what is that going to entail? Like, well, that- if so, the portion that I got to play, which was, I got to assume an earlier build, uh, since I was like over a month ago. Um, and full transparency, we're sponsored on Thursday by them to do the stream. Um. The, but I got to play it before any of that like sponsorship stuff happened. I, I fucking love it. Um, it is a it's a portion of like you starting the game and you create your character and you kind of just start running around in a very like sort of top down orthographic thing. The thing I love about it is like it has the sort of it's not top down orthographic view in the way that Diablo is. It's more like Animal Crossing where the the world is kind of like built on a cylinder to where you see further mm-hmm. off into the distance than you really should because in like in, in diablo you're mainly j- you're just seeing the ground you're not really seeing what's off in the horizon Got and it. in here you can kind of like you're seeing new horizons as you move further north you yeah you see newer horizons you see like uh the world off into the distance which is a cool kind of rendering technique that they've got going um and uh yeah it's it's like uh procedural loot so when you're picking stuff up off the ground, you might find like a um, this uh, this enemy may have like a great sword or whatever, and you're like, oh, maybe I don't like the feeling of this great sword. Let me go kill more dudes. Um, and they they may drop a bow and arrow or a magical wand or double daggers for like faster attacks or whatever. And it's still like it's built like a Souls game in terms of like you can level up strength if you want to be like a big hammer man or a big great sword guy. 
or you could level up dexterity if you want to be a bow and arrow dagger fast quick moving dude you could pick up a shield to do freaking like parries and stuff like that um but it's essentially uh moon studios version of a, what would a top-down action rpg be like if we made it uh, and it's just stunning in every way visually um and it just feels great to play like it's i really dug the the exploration and the discovery like uh, what what's shocked me the most was the amount of movement and verticality where like there there may be a lift that like takes you up to the next level and now you're mm. on the top level of this like castle or whatever but like you can just kind of climb whatever surface seems climbable <laughs> Like, it, and usually that just doesn't happen in these yeah. games. They're just, like, very, very limited and gated in that way. But I was just super blown away by, yeah, right here we're seeing on the video, like, there's so, that downed tree becomes, like, a bridge. Here, I didn't know I can get up there, but I saw a treasure, and I was like, I can't get that treasure up there until I get, like, a double jump or some shit. And no, you could just kind of climb the stones next to you and go up there and uh, get that piece of loot, but... It's interesting, because, like, looking at it, it actually kind of looks like a modern version of what the ps2 god of war games were you know like like more action rpg oh, than that but yeah, like yeah, yeah. the camera's more zoomed out but like it is it's cool that like you know obviously there's diablo inspiration there but it's like it's almost more third person uh, action I mean, game. the way i look at it is like it's a it's a top down it's a top down souls game in the way that it plays where like you have to be really thoughtful with what attacks you're taking this that you can't just go in there spamming an attack button and slash away slash away like you're it's all animation based is what the developers have mentioned so like when you when you hit that heavy attack you're dedicated to doing the full fucking heavy that you can't dodge out of it you can't mm. dodge roll or or cancel the move or whatever you're stuck there so you want to like just like a souls game attack when it's most uh, beneficial to you and dodge when it's most most beneficial to you because their attack patterns are very telegraphed as well and they you know they you see that big sort of wind up coming you know to dodge out of the way or whatever um but the yeah the boss fights are great and uh, i love the way they're doing loot they have like standard kind of common loot but they're um and then the upgrade is rare which is like the blue one that you pick up and the blue has blue. two added perks onto the onto the loot the purple one isn't just better in every way. The purple one, God damn it, I have like a rogue hair on my forehead. Uh, the purple one has um, a curse as well. Purple items are cursed. So you have two awesome benefits, really, really cool benefits on these, whether it's like added fire damage or added electric, whatever the fuck. But then there'll be a curse of like, but you can carry less weight on your character, but you have a little bit smaller of a health bar. So it's like two awesome benefits with one drawback. And then they have uh, their legendary items are really neat because they're not procedural. They're all like actually made by somebody in the studio of like, awesome. I want this item to have these perks, to have this name, to have this lore or whatever. It just seems like insanely special right off the bat, which is why I'm stoked about the early access because normally I go into early access like already like what's going to be missing? What am I going to? Mm -hmm. what, what sort of like level gating will there be or just gating period of like you can't kind of explore over here or this whole system is completely blocked off from you. I'm stoked to get in there and see, oh shit, well, what I played a month and a half ago was like really damn awesome. Yeah. Just give me more of that, um, which is what I'm super stoked for. But Andy, imagine if they just gave you the game, if it was just out, you know what I mean? I mean, you're, I mean I'd have to wait two years. <laughs> I'd have to wait two years for that, Tim. And I'm ready to hop in now. Let know? us know in the comments below if you're excited to get your hands on No Rest for the Wicked, what your thoughts are on early access overall, um, and also just what you're planning on having for dinner tonight, you know? Engage yeah. that mm -hmm. comment section. Hit that like button Comment like Andy was talking about. Do all the algo stuff. Until next time, I love you all. Fry. Goodbye. Yeah. Leftover from yesterday. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah.